Trump decided that he's going to have Senator Vance as his vice president. So what does it mean for the conflict in Ukraine? Well, I don't think it has anything to do with Ukraine specifically. Um, I think that Vance is basically a bit of insurance, the traditional thing to do for American presidential candidates is to uh, pick a vice presidential running mate uh, who complements them in some way by uh, um, by placating the other side, if you will, placating the competitors. So the choice of Pence during Trump's first uh, uh, presidential tour, uh, if you will, um, had to do with the fact that he was uh, uh, there to placate the, the religious conservative right. And um, so that's the, the traditional thing to do. And it often happens that a presidential candidate in the United States hates their running mate, but has to suffer along with them. That's what pretty much happened with Trump and Pence. And now they're enemies. Whereas this time around, since it's a shooting war and uh, Trump is uh, in the crosshairs, uh, it's time for Trump to buy some insurance policy. So J.D. Vance is basically a mini Trump. If, if anything happens to Trump, uh, uh, J.D. Vance will be the proud inheritor of the entire campaign to make America great. Um, and um, so that's, that's the real obvious reason behind that choice. Uh, there isn't really much of a need for another. Now, somehow, Coupling that to the Ukraine, um, you know, that makes a major mistake, which is thinking that the Ukraine is somehow important or significant. Now, what happened is uh, Biden and, and his uh, team of uh, uh, whatever you want to call them, crackheads, if you include his son, decided that they, they could defeat Russia by arming the Ukrainians. And that has famously failed. Um, it was a hopeless gambit to begin with. Nobody in their right mind ever thought that it was going to work. And now it hasn't worked. And it's time to do the traditional American thing. What the Americans always do is they, they venture into some uh, foreign military campaign. Uh, they, uh, they enrich their military industrial com complex are, were at this point saved from bankruptcy because it's so consolidated at this point and so far in debt and so owned by uh, financial capital like BlackRock that they're really, uh, you know, a heartbeat away from outright bankruptcy. They're not doing very well. So this was a, a last, last ditch effort to save them, if you will, by throwing money at them. It turn, didn't turn out the way they expected because what the Russians did was uh, uh, invent on the spot, invent countermeasures to all of these fancy American weapons. And now they're useless. They're useless for export and they're useless for any conceivable use by the U.S. military itself. So the solution is to do the traditional thing when you lose. What the Americans do is declare victory and go home and celebrate. So what they'll do this time, and 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 of course, uh, you, you can't very well do it in the course of one administration. So uh, one administration causes the problem and the other quote unquote fixes it. So the Biden administration started the war in the Ukraine and the Trump administration will fix it by uh, uh, by winning the peace, they will say, and uh, he will appear as the great peacemaker and what's more, saving lots and lots of money. And, and the troops will, will uh, you know, be pulled back, whatever, whatever American troops are there now in secret will go home. Of course, all of these American weapons systems like Patriot are being manned by Americans. Everybody knows that. They're dying uh, by the dozen. And of course, the, the the news media can't say a thing about that. But all of that nightmare will finally be over, and 
Trump will look like a winner, even though the war has been lost. So that that's really what's going to happen. And it's sort of like, it's this little banana republic aspect to American quote unquote democracy, where uh, Biden got into office and threw out every single executive order just about that, uh, that Trump signed. There is no doubt in my mind that Trump will do the same. So basically four years of Biden will be erased. And uh, well, we, we, we don't know what happens next because Trump could uh, find that, that uh, the military industrial complex is uh, too powerful to fight and will end up throwing money at it in, in confront, confronting China or some other ridiculous thing. And the cycle will repeat. But it's the cycle. It's not the particular people involved. It's it's this uh, it's this incredible death loop that the United States is in, where it has to fight stupid wars and has to keep losing them ever since Vietnam. Why he thinks this way? Why he thinks getting closer to the more traditional part of the Republican Party would be beneficial for him? And what do they represent that would benefit him? Well, he's uh, J.D. Vance is basically a, an anti-Trump, except that their politics are identical. You know, he's from the Rust Belt, and and, and Trump is a New Yorker. Uh, he's from a humble beginnings, and Trump is a born millionaire, billionaire. Um, he's uh, he spent his his time, his career, uh, doing actual real things, whereas Trump is just a playboy. So they complement each other that way, but that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that they their politics are the same, that they agree on policy. And that's why Trump picked him. Everything else is just show. We know that when it comes to the foreign policy of the United States, the senator is totally against China. He says that we have to shift the focus from Russia to China. And his policy in, is in that direction. That's why I don't think that he would bring any sort of peace to the foreign policy of the United States. Oh no, fighting China is the most peaceful thing the United States can do, other than just rolling over and playing dead. Uh, this is this is a country that produces maybe a trillion dollars worth of uh, um, trade, profit from trading with the United States. China is basically robbing the United States blind. Uh, China is sitting in such a hoard of uh, U.S. treasuries that if it, if it only coughed and sneezed in the direction of selling it off, uh, the United States would be finished. Um, all of China's interests are very far away from America's shores. And, and so it is really projecting power in its own backyard, whereas the United States would have to sail across the world's largest ocean, which covers half the planet. If you spin the globe right, you, you see that. Um, so, oh, and the other thing is that the, um, the, the entire uh, defense establishment, the military industrial complex in the United States, is in business of assembling things out of Chinese-made parts. And since they stupidly imposed embargoes on various types of Chinese uh, imports, such as specific, specific types of ICs, specific materials, etc., they will now have to resort to importing entire modules and assembling them. So I wouldn't be surprised if the next iteration uh, involves Chinese-made jet engines that get popped into American aircraft as they are, no assembly required. So uh, basically the whole idea of uh, the United States standing up in opposition to China, anybody who is not completely foolish knows that this is just words, that, that there's no substance behind that, because the next thing the United States would have to do after declaring war on China is unconditionally surrender. Trump recently was talking about Russia and China, specifically on China. He said that 
I'm not going to fight them. I'm going to have a some sort of economic war with China. How he can manage these people who are mostly against China and want to make some sort of escalations in Taiwan in term militarily I'm talking about is that possible to Trump to manage that because he wasn't he wasn't able to do that for Ukraine when he came to power in his first term he was doing everything sending weapons helping Ukraine training Ukrainians everything was in those days and even he put more sanctions than other presidents in the United States right now it seems to me that they're saying no, this guy d- doesn't like the war in Ukraine because he wants to focus on China. He doesn't like the war in Ukraine because uh, he's lost it. If it's his war, then he's lost it. If he, in fact, started it. Uh, it's not clear who exactly started it. It happened under Biden. There's a lot of inertia built into the American system. So uh, basically... Uh, The Ukrainian conflict is such a mess that it is time for the United States to declare victory and go home. The traditional thing that the Americans always do when they lose a military campaign and it becomes an embarrassment. So it'll probably, that'll probably happen. The other, the the other fact is the U.S. is fresh out of enemies. So it can't fight Russia. That didn't go well. Who's left? Well, China. Because China will just sit there and smile beatifically while the the United States, uh, you know, a, attempts to somehow confront it and pretend that it's going to do something um, uh, militarily or economically. Uh, the the point is that you know uh, uh, the United States does a huge amount of trade with China, without which it would not be able to survive economically. But for the, from the point of view of the Chinese, that's only one-sixth of the total. So, yeah, that's a, a large amount, one-sixth of, of your entire trade, a little over that, or no, a little less than that. It, it's, it's a significant amount, but it's not like uh, it would kill the, the Chinese. They have a lot of other countries to, to trade with. So if it's an economic war, um, China can shoot the United States in the head. The United States cannot shoot China in the head. And that's how it stands. So whatever they're talking about, it's because they have to have an enemy. They absolutely have to have an enemy. Even if it makes no sense, they have to pick somebody. And so they could pick China or they could pick Mars. It's a a warlike planet. It has a warlike coloring. Uh, so let's build some rockets to blow up Mars and spend the next 50 years doing it. Why not? It, that would be an identical waste of money, just as ridiculous. It seems that they want to shift from Russia to China. It's, we have all the evidence out there. When you look at the NATO summit, they started in, they invited Australia, New Zealand, and Japan and South Korea. When you see what's going on in Philippines, the escalation in Taiwan, right now he's Donald Trump is picking a senator who is totally against China. We have each and everything that we do need to understand what would be the foreign policy of the United States if Trump wins. But at the same time, we're witnessing that China is in Belarus. Russia and China are doing some exercises in South China Sea and Russia in North Korea. Well, look, there are two different things and it's very important not to confuse them. Uh, Thing number one is uh, noise coming out of American politicians' mouths during election campaigns has nothing to do with reality. It's called lying as if you're running for office. Traditionally, in American politics, once you're elected, you completely ignore everything you promised while you were running for office and go on and do something else, usually something that other people tell you to do and nobody knows what, who those people are. So that, that's, that's what's going on. And, and again, you could 
take the word China coming out of J.D. Vance's mouth and substitute tiddlywinks, and it would be just as significant. It would be just as meaningful. And the other thing is, uh, well, you want to go to war against China or Russia or both? Well, you'll probably get both. You might get Iran and North Korea and, and Belarus kind of thrown in. Um, so the point is, don't do it and don't even pretend that you want to do it. So they might be talking about, you know, they might, they have to talk about some enemy, right? China is safe to talk about because that's like typical. That, that's exactly like threatening to go to war against Mars. Um, it, everybody knows it's not going to happen, but it sounds good. So why not say it? And the other thing would be what's going on in Gaza. And we know that Senator Vance is totally in line with the Netanyahu administration and their policy in Gaza. And even little differences that the Biden administration had with Netanyahu, it seems that they would be totally in line with each other if Trump wins. And in your opinion, is there any possibility to change their policy on the, under the Trump administration in Gaza? Of course there is. Once the election campaign is over, uh, they can actually uh, decide what it is they want to do. But while the election campaign is happening, you think J.D. Vance wants to lose the Jewish money? That's that it, he wants to get as many big Jews to donate to their campaign as possible. And to do that, you basically talk up the friendship between the United States and Israel and full support for whoever is in charge in Israel and not breathe a word of anything against Israel because you'd lose some money. That's all it is. There's no reason to think of anything having to do with with real politics. This is just campaigning. How do you see Trump's ability to do some political changes in the Middle East? Is that possible or the face of Middle East has already changed and is not reversible? Well, during his first term, he uh, he didn't really do that well because he's he's a little unpredictable and he's kind of a clown, and that doesn't go over well in the Middle East. People there, uh, it's an honor-based society, and they don't like dealing with clowns, even if it's the U.S. president. So nothing has changed. So he'll he'll do some other clown act. And it'll look like people are paying attention to him, but in reality, nothing will change. That's that's the expected thing. And what's important in the Middle East is what what is called facts on the ground, which is uh, the Houthis have shut down uh, the uh, the Red Sea and, and the Suez Canal. Um, another step in that direction would be to shut down Gibraltar, for instance, or uh, shut down the Straits of Hormuz. Um, it's doable at this point because uh, the Navy, the U.S. Navy and the Allied navies are no longer capable of keeping the sea lanes clear. And that, that is a huge new development that Trump cannot do anything about and that no, about, no amount of uh, hot air coming out of his mouth could possibly change. It is, it is a very harsh recognition that 500 years of uh, European and then American naval superiority has come to an end. And, and uh, the, the, the fact that this has happened will take a long time to sink in, uh, but eventually it will. In his first time, he tried to withdraw the American troops in, in Syria. Do you think that he's going to do that right now or he's not going to? be able to change the policy in Syria? Um, I'm not sure what it has to do with Trump. I'm not sure he even knows where who these people are and, you know, anything. You know, it's, it, he's not really relevant to the picture. I'm not sure what's most relevant to the picture, but it could possibly have something to do with the, the fact that Europe is becoming such a mess 
that you can't really get the uh, the the Syrians, the millions of Syrians who've been living as refugees in Turkey, to consider going to Europe. So they're no longer something that us uh, uh, that uh, um, that Turkey can use to threaten Europe. If you don't do the right thing, we'll inundate you with these Syrian refugees. Uh, they've done that a, a few uh, uh, times before, and Erdogan has, play, has played that card with some success. Um, he, he even got billions of euros for, for keeping uh, those, uh, uh, those refugees, those, uh, those uh, Syrian migrants, in Turkey as opposed to unleashing them on, on the Greek border uh, from which they could penetrate the rest of the European Union. Well, it seems like the European Union is such a mess that the Syrians don't really want to go there. Instead, they would like to go home. And to do that, uh, Syria would need to be rebuilt. Americans would need to get flushed out of there so that Syria once again gets its oil revenue instead of having it be stolen by the Americans. Uh, and, and then people would go back to their homes and, and resume their lives that have been suspended for uh, for a decade, even more. So it probably has something to do with that, as opposed to anything that the Americans have nothing to do. It seems to me that Orban sees that if Trump wins, he would bring some sort of peace to Europe, and considering the conflict in Ukraine. But how about the position of Orban, Orban's position in the European Union, and people who are thinking the way that Orban thinks? Well, the way Orban thinks is uh, patriotic. He, he, thinks, um, he thinks about his people. He thinks about Hungarians. He doesn't think about global interests. He flushed out the Soros organization out of Hungary. In spite of that, he lost some votes during the last election. And that's something that he would like to fix. And this entire shuttle diplomacy gambit was a really good way for him to shore up his authority at home. Because look, uh, our little president of our little country flies all over the world and everybody talks to him and everybody takes him seriously. And look at how he's annoying these bureau bureaucrats in Brussels. Uh, the Hungarians see that and, and they just love it. So... Uh, Orban is uh, a political animal from a very young age when he, he ran the, uh, the chapter of the Young Communist League in, in his school, back when he was a schoolboy. He knows how to garner support from the populace, and he's found a really good way to do it. Now, what does that mean in terms of uh, the United States or in terms of the European Union? He doesn't really care. He cares about Hungary. He doesn't care about the European Union. The only thing he likes about the European Union is that Brussels keeps sending him money. If it wasn't for that, he'd just give up on it altogether. When you look at the former vice president of Trump and right now, Senator Vance, how do you draw the difference between these two guys? It seems to me that they're in the same type of mindset. I think they're very capable of inquiring as to the health of the president and attending state funerals. Both of them are extremely good at that. That is the entire job definition of a U.S. vice president, and we can leave it at that. And the other issue would be how Trump would manage to talk with Putin. And do you think that he's going to do the way that he was doing during the first term? Or he has learned something from his latest experience and he's going to do differently when it comes to Russia, the relationship between Russia and the United States? Well, I, I don't think that that's going to go all that well because he doesn't he doesn't have the the patience. Putin has all the patience in the world. Putin also has all the facts. 
Putin has all the paperwork. He's going to go through every little flaws of legalese of, of uh, uh, signed documents between uh, the United States and Russia and various international documents. And his point is going to be, why make new deals when you're not paying attention to the old deals? Um, what What is the purpose of of piling new dead letters on top of old dead letters. If you want to reestablish our trust, then let's go back to the documents that you've signed before, such as no NATO expansion. So what's going on with uh, NATO expansion? Why don't you roll it back and then we'll talk. You see, Russia is in a position now where it has the entire Eurasian uh, continent. It has it has China, it has India, it has uh, uh, Iran, uh, it has uh, the, the Arab states uh, wanting to join BRICS, some of them. Uh, it has uh, Turkey, which is a, a NATO, major NATO force, wanting or thinking about joining BRICS. Russia is, is what's called in the catbird seat. It, its economy is growing. It's doing extremely well. Its, it's a government is popular. It isn't in any sort of crisis whatsoever. And the United States is out of time, out of money, in horrible shape, uh, in the middle of a, a political upheaval. Russia can just sit back and say, let's work on reestablishing trust. Now, here's this dusty old document. Why don't you review it and tell us how you will execute on this document, NATO expansion, for instance. And if you come up with a positive answer, then you can move forward and maybe talk about new agreements. And otherwise, what's the point? I'm sure that Trump would find that attitude just completely infuriating. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I can't even imagine how he could play a productive role in, in a relationship like that, where he, he walks in with his, his usual bluster and, and uh, you know, rhetoric and is, is given a receipt in, in, in response and, and uh, told to go to the archives and dig it out. When, whenever we talk about the relationship between Russia and the United States, everybody is talking about 2007, that Munich conference that Putin said that no expansion to NATO. What we know before that, we had the ABM Treaty, just United States withdrawing from the ABM Treaty, which was huge. And we have ABM Treaty, NATO expansion, INF Treaty, which was done by Donald Trump, by his administration. And at the same time, you see people in the United States, in the West, are so hopeful of what Donald Trump would do when it comes to Russia. And I don't know what, how he can manage that when we have all the evidence that he is not going to change anything when it comes to the foreign policy of the United States toward Russia? Well, look, I, I don't think it has to do with what Americans or Trump or anybody wants to do. I think it has to do with what they uh, will be able to do or won't be able to do. Uh, financially, the United States is an extremist. If, if you look at the, the budget deficit, if, if you look at how the economy is going um, in general, if, if you look at the trade deficit, if you look at uh, 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 the fact that the do dollar is losing its reserve uh, currency status all over the world, people are shying away from it. And, and the, that process is picking up speed. Um, the United States is a, a has been as far as uh, you know, a world power, a superpower. There is really not very much it can do, but also one of the things it cannot do is tell its people that it's over, that their that their quality of life is already abysmal, but it's going to get a lot worse. 
uh, that things are just generally going to get worse. Now, Trump is a politician, and as Bill Clinton rather astutely said, nobody has ever gotten, gotten into office by promising less. So Trump has to promise more. He, so he's, he's promising to make America great again. And uh, the question is, what's the timeline on that deliverable? Has it slid any? Um, uh, are there any interim mile, milestones so that we can um, keep, keep some kind of a metric on how great the America is, America is becoming again? Or is this just something that'll happen one day, like snow falling off a roof? Boom, America is great again. Because I see no signs of America becoming any greater. In fact, it's shrinking in, in many ways. And so this is just rhetoric. Now, in terms of foreign policy, I think the United States will, ha will be forced to do less of it. It will have to... Uh, deal with weighty issues such as do we allow the major uh, military contractors to go bankrupt or do we nationalize them? The United States is not very good at nationalizing things, but it did manage to do a fairly good job of controlling industry during World War II. I doubt that it would be able to do it again. So we may be looking at a whole bunch of uh, contract uh, military contract contractors basically going belly up. And I would expect Boeing to be the first. Um, and, and a lot of things like that will, will happen. Um, the, a lot of things that, that have been going on for too long in America um, haven't run their course, but there, there's no more room for them. Uh, so the, the fact that uh, uh, more than a quarter of the economy in the United States is being eaten up by uh, by by medical care, by uh, by the entire medical establishment, that's a disaster. And the fact that for all that money, it's providing a quality of care that's worse than Cuba, of all places, which has a tiny fraction of uh, of expenditure per capita. Uh, things like that are something that that Americans should pay attention to, not, not what's happening across the world in a country that no longer even pays attention to them necessarily. Um, but the question is, is the American system even remotely reformable or will any effort to reform it cause it to crack up and fall apart? That is a very big question. And that's something that we should be carefully watching in the coming year. Yeah. Dimitri, before wrapping up this session, how do you find if you were to connect these dots, the assassination of Donald Trump and the attempts to kill Vladimir Putin. On, we know that the Ukrainian government was talking about that they're trying to do everything to kill Vladimir Putin. And there were some attempts to kill Orban, Erdogan, Fitzo. And how do you put all of them together? What's the problem in your opinion? How we can connect all these dots together? I don't know that we'll ever get enough information, but there are some very interesting statements being made. There's a character by the name of uh, uh, Medvedchuk, who is a, a friend of Putin. He's Ukrainian. He's a head of a, a Ukrainian opposition party that's been banned. Uh, he was... Uh, arrested and beaten up by the Zelensky gang and eventually traded by the Russians. So now he's safe and, and sound in, in Russia, uh, looking kind of uh, worse for the wear and tear, I would say. But he said that the uh, it'll probably come out that the uh, attempt to, attempted assassination of Donald Trump was organized by the Ukrainians. He just came out and said that. So we'll have to uh, sit back and watch. Um, the thing is that the, the Americans and the Brits are just as good at political assassination, if not better, than the Ukrainians. So we really just don't know who, who, who did that. Uh, the, uh, the entire spectacle uh, for anyone looked a little bit scripted. 
uh, it looked like uh, some kind of a uh, something almost designed specifically to make uh, Donald Trump look like a martyr and and a hero. Um, and and uh, it it's it produces a, a kind of an uncomfortable feeling that what we're watching is not real. That there's a kind of a, a lack of reality to what everyone is talking about. That there's something else going on that we're not being told. Now, whether it ever comes out or not, we don't know. Uh, we still don't know who killed Kennedy. So it may actually just stay hidden forever. People are still uh, arguing about 9-11, not so much, but you know, there's really no consensus. Uh, even though the official uh, story is completely preposterous, um, there are a lot of a lot of things like that that are hidden and stay hidden for a very long time, and this is probably one of them. Mm -hmm.